Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to all of you, including Philip Shane, Paul Boyer, Brad, and our brand new patron, Chris. Everybody welcome Chris. Thank you, Chris. Hey, Chris. Yay, Chris. On this episode of DTNS, what you can do to safeguard your company against the next CrowdStrike style bug, and what you should do if you think your social security number just leaked along with millions of others. Plus, Epic just launched its games store on mobile. It's Epic. Literally. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, August 16th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us, former CISO at Levi Strauss and currently uh, operating a security advisory practice at S3 Consulting, Steve Zalewski, welcome. Hello, audience. <laughs> uh, thank you, David Spark, for, for sending you along our way. I appreciate you taking his recommendation. Yeah, well, I figured David said you guys are good, so... You know, how can I say no? Well, we'll tr yeah, we'll try to, we'll try not to, to let that. him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Are you going to live up to that or down to that? You guys decide. Okay? Yeah, okay. we'll do our best. We'll do one of those. Uh, right before the show, uh, we got the word that a U.S. judge has temporarily blocked the launch of that sports streaming service venue. Apparently it was going to launch pretty soon, maybe next week. Uh, but Disney, Warner Brothers, Discovery and Fox are now enjoined from launching it until uh, Fubo gets their day in court. Fubo has been uh, levying some antitrust accusations against Venue, saying they won't sell Fubo the rights to these sports, but then they go and keep them all to themselves. And the judge said, well, you know what? Let's have this lawsuit first uh, before we let them launch that. All right, let's start with the quick hits. In the latest Windows 11 Canary test build, you can now create drive partitions in FAT32 bigger than 32 gigabytes. In fact, up to two terabytes, as long as you do it from the command line. Windows could read larger FAT32 partitions already. It just couldn't create them. While we're talking Windows, a new feature for Power Toys is coming to version 0.84 called Power Toys Workspaces that can launch a collection of apps that you choose for a shortcut and then arrange their windows in a custom layout on your monitor. Just to keep you up to date, ByteDance has officially begun its appeal of the U.S. law that would ban TikTok from being distributed in the U.S. if ByteDance didn't sell it. Uh, in addition to its First Amendment defense, ByteDance claimed the Department of Justice made factual errors in its filing about the amount of data stored in China and the amount of control over U.S. TikTok by the Chinese government. Publishers Dot Dash Meredith and Ziff Davis both told shareholders that the rollout of Google's AI overviews in the U.S. had no significant change to search engine referrals to their sites. Some publishers and folks in general are wondering how much effect it does have. Search Engine Land points out that AI overviews only appeared on 7% of queries by the end of July. Primate Labs, makers of the popular Geekbench app for benchmarking chips, has released version 1.0 of Geekbench AI. It measures speed and accuracy of machine learning workloads uh, on CPUs, GPUs, and Intel and Qualcomm NPUs, the neural processing units. It doesn't work yet for AMD NPUs, but they're working on getting support for that. Geekbench AI is free, and you can run it on Windows, Mac OS, Linux, iOS, iPad OS, and Android. Walmart and DroneUp are closing down their drone delivery hubs in Walmart stores in Phoenix, in Salt Lake City, and in Tampa, Florida, and will focus on service in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Delivery hubs remain in Bentonville, Arkansas, that's where Walmart's headquarters are, and Virginia Beach, Virginia. The company currently spends $30 per delivery and would like to shrink that to about $7 or even less. Meanwhile, IKEA is upgrading its warehouse inventory drones to work alongside human workers throughout the day instead of being limited to just non-operational hours. The Epic Games Store has launched worldwide on Android and in Europe on iOS. Uh, you can now get Fortnite, uh, Rocket League Sideswipe, and Fall Guys in its own Epic Games Store. 
uh, on iOS in the EU. Uh, you can also get those three games on the Alt Store Pal, another third-party app store you can install in Europe, or if you appear to be in Europe. Uh, Epic also plans to bring its games to the Aptoid iOS store in the EU and the One Store on Android. Uh, now, if you go to Epic's FAC, it's going to tell you you need iOS 17.4 to do this. Uh, apparently, everybody who's tried it needs iOS 17.6. And if you were to scan the QR code from Epic's site, it'll give you a pop-up that says 17.6. So don't believe the fact They haven't updated it. Epic wants everything in their PC store to be on mobile eventually. Right now, you just got those three titles I mentioned. But curated third-party apps will be arriving in December. And the ability for developers to self-publish their games is coming in 20. 25. Now, I tried the download of the Epic Game Store for my uh, Pixel Fold, and it's super simple. Uh, I just went to the Epic Games website. They've got a link right there on the on the homepage. You tap that link. Uh, you see a warning from Android that the file could damage your computer, uh, and then you tap download anyway, ignoring the security warning. Uh, then you open the downloaded file manually, uh, go to settings, enable a permission to download unknown apps from the source Epic Games, uh, and then you can install the app. It's that simple. Uh, it's actually kind of a similar process for iOS in the EU, I understand. Uh, open the browser, switch to settings, give permissions, et cetera, et cetera. Sarah, what's not to love? I don't know. Uh, this is obviously a huge win for Epic. I mean, Epic has uh, and continues to uh, not exactly play nicely with Apple about uh, the limitations uh, in the past, particularly around Fortnite. Um, but yeah, I guess as an iOS user, you know, I don't I don't play a lot of games, so Epic specifically doesn't really apply to me. Um, I assume that some U.S. users might be like, oh, come on, you know, launch it in the U.S. too, uh, instead of just in the EU. Android users are like, yay, global. <laughs> you guys get to say that about a lot of things. And uh, that, that said, third-party app stores in general, I mean, there's only going to be so many third-party app stores that are frequented and, you know, make some sort of a top 10 list, right? You can't just have that many of them or, you know, you're just you're not going to get a lot of traffic um, and usage. But to have the opportunity to do that uh, is just, it's, it's choice for consumers. And I, I, I always say yay to that. Yeah, Epic may blaze a trail here. They may popularize this, at least where it's allowed. Uh, Steve, I, I know you're not uh, necessarily going to go install the Epic Game Store right away, especially after the description I just gave. But what, what, do, you, what do you make of this cat and mouse game that they're playing? Yeah, <clears throat> all I could think of is this is like two sets of in-laws where they have to get along because they want their kids to be happy. Mm -hmm. And in this case, the kids is revenue. And so what they're trying to figure out how to do is, okay, we want to maximize our revenue, which means we somehow have to find some common ground. But, you know, it's like two porcupines. It's slow <laughs> and it goes through a whole lot of machinations, but they have to keep working with each other because they want their kids to be happy, meaning they yeah. want the revenue. So that's kind of my oversimplification when I watch this is, I just think it's like a couple of sets of in-laws, you know what I mean? So it's yeah, a, yeah. a whole lot of time and effort that's going into something that could be a lot simpler if they wanted it to be. Apple and Epic staying together for the kids. Look there you go. <laughs> yeah, I like the that. Kids. That's a good the analogy. financial kids. Right. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, public records data provider National Public Data has confirmed multiple reports and even some class action lawsuits alleging that back in April of 2024, it was breached with 2.9 billion records accessed and subsequently leaked online. Those records would include names, mailing addresses, physical addresses, if those are different, social security numbers, emails. National Public Data believes the breach is associated with a threat actor that was trying to hack into the data in late December of 2023. Um, didn't, didn't confirm the breach, has since confirmed the breach as of Friday, August 16th. The data includes multiple records per person. So, for example, a record for each address or other change of information if you moved apartments over the last 10 years. Or records for non-U.S. people, also included. If you're concerned, you should freeze your credit reports, 
the Equifax or Experian or TransUnion, that process is free. I actually did it for Experian before the show. It was pretty easy. You can unfreeze those at any time if you happen to need to access them for loan approval or some other reason. Okay, so Steve, a lot of people saying that's a lot of uh, very personal information. You know, am I going to get my identity stolen now? What should people be aware of and and, and what's your take on this? Yeah, so... <clears throat> To a certain extent, it's a yawn. As a security practitioner, this is just yet another case of the data being scraped out of the net. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, when I think about it this way, I say, for most people, their information has been out there for years and years. If you think this is the first time your data is out there, right, it's been there. I go, remember when we had those big yellow books that had your name, your address, and your phone number as public Uh, records? I used to sit on those when I was a kid. used to throw them on your front porch and anybody could get them. They used to throw like five at a time. Five at a time. So that information's been out there forever. All it's doing is being propagated forward. And then the major credit bureaus have been breached. So your social security number, for the most part, is there. Okay. And so when I look at this, I say, let's just use some common sense, okay? It's happened. The likelihood that you're going to have a bad consequence is low. But freezing your credit, like they talked about, just good common sense. Stop sharing your information on all the websites. Say no when they're asking for cookies or to sell Mm -hmm. your data, right? So what you have to do is find practical ways to reduce your footprint of the data that's on the internet so that you reduce the likelihood of being impacted. When I was at Levi Strauss, right, we had 10,000 people. That's 10,000 human identities that have both the business and the private side, right? And we would get the calls all the time, oh my goodness, what do I do? And that's what we said, which was just apply some common sense, right? Limit the likelihood that you're going to be breached and know what to do if it's unfortunately happened to you. Yeah, I, I, it's a really good point. Uh, that Equifax data breach in 2017 affected about half of the people in the United States. Uh, right. So there's a there's a good chance, there's a 50-50 chance that you were affected by that one. Uh, if not another one, there was a big Yahoo hack uh, not that long ago either. Uh, so yeah, you want to freeze all three of these credit reports uh, so that someone can't perpetrate fraud in your name, open up a, a loan account in your name. Um, but otherwise, uh, it, it's not comfortable, is it? Uh, but but it is true that you know you're you're probably not that much more at risk now than you were before this breach. Is that fair to say, Steve? That is fair to say. <clears throat> and unfortunately, you know, again, as a security practitioner, what you want to do is it wants to be hard enough for your data to be breached that they go find somebody that's an easier target. Yeah. Right. And so taking yeah. these kinds of steps just raises the bar enough that they go find somebody else. I've and I hate to say it question. that way, but practically, right, an ounce of prevention, that's what this is. And, you know, Europe and Asia, right, they've got other places they can go as well. So this gets back to locking the front door. Just good common sense. These are not hard things to do, but they're also just getting you to appreciate what's within your control and what's not, right? Yeah. The data is on the net. It's not going to go away anytime soon. Right. The damage has been done, but you can manage, right, the visibility of your data on the net. Um, Dumb question. So freezing your credit reports, like I said, on Experian, which I I get monthly Experian reports anyway, uh, but I've never frozen my data. So I logged in, found it. Yeah, it was free. Um, Why don't people just always do this? Or have we should we have been doing this all along? freezing all of our credit information unless we specifically needed it for something like getting a new apartment. So uh, again, here's what I'm going to say. Humans are intrinsically lazy. (laughs) So until it happens to you, right, you've always got something else to do or that you want to do. And so to your point, everybody should go do this. I'll also call out for a lot of people, 
they've had these kinds of incidences and the different companies have given them a year of credit reporting for free. So I mm -hmm. say the same thing. How many of them have seen that letter go, oh, right, I only have to go to the website. It take me 30 seconds. But do you prioritize that enough to be able to protect yourself? And the key yeah. is we can tell you to do it, okay, but we can't make you do it. Yeah. And uh, my dog and your dog agree. You should do. <laughs> you should definitely do it. <laughs> Uh, I, <laughs> he, I would he really say seems passionate about this. You, you don't want to be, you don't, you want them to go after someone else, uh, who's a, an easier target. So make it harder. I'm totally with Steve. I, I would say, don't try to convince your neighbor to unfreeze their credit reports just to make them an easier target. That seems like it might be going too far. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, folks, uh, if you have feedback about anything that gets brought up on the show, get in touch with the DTNS audience on the social networks. Uh, we are on X at DTNS show. We are on Mastodon at DTNS show dot Mastodon dot social or at Mastodon dot social MSTDN dot social. I should say we are at Daily Tech News Show on TikTok and at DTNS picks DTNS PIX on Instagram and threads. Last weekend at DEF CON, CrowdStrike President Michael Santonis accepted the Most Epic Fail Award for the company's faulty security update. You know, the one that led to millions of Windows machines crashing around the world. Uh, we previously talked to Will Harris, CEO of Unbound, about how bugs happen from the provider side, from the company side, and what he does to try to at least squelch them and prevent them. Uh, so today we wanted to talk about what companies can do to prepare for the inevitable bugs that will come from vendors. Now, Steve, hopefully we don't see something quite this big again, but just in case, what can people do to be ready? So this is Friday. So it's our, our hat staff, Friday. This is yeah. one of those, hey, look, okay, it's going to happen again. And Nice, I like the hat. That's and great. so <laughs> I would like to be on the staff. I'm throwing my hat in the ring with the rest of you guys. And I would say a breach like this was an accident. And in complex systems, it's happened before, it'll happen again. <clears throat> and that what we're really talking about here right, is an appreciation for the people, the process, and the technologies that have been either overtly or kind of under the curtains or under the uh, behind the curtains been changing in the industry that all of a sudden we got caught short. And that we're going to see changes now in the people in the process and the technologies as a result of this. So if I'm a business and I'm like, okay, great. I, I, I don't like to hear it, Steve, but I think you're right. You know, bugs happen and we're going to have one to happen again. Uh, you know, what are some of the things that you think are, are good practices to mitigate those risks and 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 maybe get yourself in the in the best possible position for dealing with it when it does happen again. Yep. So I've talked to other security practitioners, right? Other CISOs. We've talked about this at, at length. And one of the questions I posed, which was from an introspective perspective, right? Which mm. was, what did we change? Right? What have we done differently in the last five or eight years? that supported this opportunity for a business outage because of a mistake. And there's a couple things, right? As a good business practitioner, right, we say, what happened to testing patches in non-production before you put them into production? Mm -hmm. Common thing you do for business applications, okay? Why would security applications be any different? And so therefore, why did we come, why did we kind of migrate away from that practice for security where we still do it for business applications? Yeah, I, I'm going to guess you're going to have some people say it's because it's a security patch. And, you know, you, you, you don't want to spend a minute un, insecure if you don't have to, right? So there's, there's two answers to that we talk about. Your point here is, look, speed kills. Okay, mm -hmm. the speed with which they attack us is killing us. Therefore, we have to respond in kind. So we can't take the time to patch the to test the patches mm -hmm. because that just leaves us more vulnerable. But there's a second consideration here, which was, and we've been pushed right over the last couple of years on the resources that we have for security. 
the tax of security. And so we don't necessarily have the resources anymore. They're needed for something else to run our SOC or our SIM, right? Mm -hmm. Or to manage other key security controls. And therefore we have backed ourselves in the corner and said, we just don't have the resources to do it. So we have to trust the vendor and we're accepting the risk, but we never communicated the fact that we're accepting that risk. <laughs> okay? Uh huh. Yeah. And so that's where I say you're going to see changes now, uh -huh. right? Where people are now realizing, gee whiz, we've been doing this long enough. We kind of worked, we walk, talked ourselves out of certain controls, compensating controls to protect our business that now we have to reevaluate how we arrived at our current decision and maybe walk that back a little bit. This is a, I'm going to preface this by saying it's an unfair question, but if you had to guess, which do you think is the bigger risk getting hit because you delayed a patch or uh, going down because you didn't test a patch? And this, now we're going to get into the welcome to being a CISO. Uh -huh. And welcome to understanding what is, if you do a business impact analysis, right, which is what processes in your company are the key processes that if compromised will result in an extinction level event. Mm -hmm. For some companies, it's revenue. For other companies, it's protecting PII. For other companies, it might be the intellectual property. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is where now as a CISO, there's no one size fits all. It's how well do you understand what is the key resources, if you want, the crown jewels. Mm -hmm. And based on that and the attacker types, right, which is how are the attackers hitting you and what types? If it's nation state versus script kitties versus organized crime, so you have to understand the attack types. Given all that, then you get to make a call, right? Which was, do I have to worry about speed at all costs to stop attacks? Or, right, can I understand my key business processes like retail stores and the cash registers and I can take a day to be able to do some non-prod testing of a few of them before I push it out because that's an acceptable risk. That's what we're having to be able to communicate to our leadership teams and realizing no one size fits all. Is there any value in looking at redundancy and and having multiple vendors rather than relying on, on sing, single security vendors? Yes, absolutely. Right. Makes perfect sense. When I worked at PG&E, we had a nuclear power plant. Mm -hmm. Okay. There, all systems were in triplicate. Everything had to be in triplicate, right? Three, not just redundant, but triply redundant systems. Okay. The problem with that is that's incredibly expensive. And if you cannot pass along those costs, because for many companies, right, they're in the business of being in business then those costs for security or like, you know, the tax for security starts to get higher and higher. And then they start to figure out where is the risk versus the reward. So absolutely go to two vendors. All I have to do is buy two products, train up a team to know how to run two products, patch both products. Right. And then as soon as budgets get tight again, they're going to say, we'll do a consolidation. Because mm -hmm. look what's happening in the industry now. Right. Which was, we're wanting to consolidate the amount of technology we have on the shelf to be able to drive down the people and the process costs so that the tax of security on the business is as low as we can drive it. Yeah, what do you what do you say if you're the CISO and uh, your CEO is saying, we can't pay this security tax anymore, we gotta consolidate? Mm -hmm. Not, <laughs> now I wanna say, hey, come join the team Right, uh -huh. Because how do you now have a conversation that says, am I here to secure my company? Am I here to protect the business? Or am I here, like at Levi's, to sell more jeans? Which is, what are the metrics that you're accountable for to your leadership team so that you can now say, I can't protect everything equally 
here's what I can and can't protect and be able to have that conversation where they will understand the risk and sign off on it. Yeah. Welcome to the kind of the state of the art of governance, risk and compliance. It all, it all comes down to prioritization and there's, there's never an easy answer to any of these questions. Is there? There, there isn't an easy answer, but that doesn't mean you can't arrive at an answer. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that gets back to the, Hey, as a CISO, if you're just a technologist and you think you're just going to tell the business how to stop an attack, right? Prevent it. Well, the business has kind of said that that day has come and passed. Now you have to have a negotiation with me around risk, right? And now I have to be able to prevent, but then I have to detect and contain. Now we're talking about resiliency, right? Now we're talking about an expansion of our role to be able to look at the business the way the business looks at business risk, right? Which was, okay, I can have an earthquake, right? Or I can have an executive die. How do I manage through those types of risk crises? It's just cybersecurity is another form of business risk that happens a lot more often than many of the other types of business risk scenarios. Well, Steve, hopefully uh, some people in the audience could take this uh, to to their their teams and their managers and 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 make good use of it. Thanks for for passing along your knowledge about it to folks. Sure, happy to. And that's what I said. My job at this point is to pay it forward, to share the experience. And I'll tell everybody out there, right? In security, we have no secrets because we have a common enemy, right? The bad guys are trying to attack all of our businesses. And we really, as a community, have a shared responsibility. So sharing like this, talking about the problems really in the security community is our only possible way forward for all of us, right? To be able to provide a common defense against a common enemy. That's great advice. Uh, Before we get out of here, though, uh, Sarah is going to check the mail. I am. And I found a mail, a piece of mail. (laughs) Look at that. Andrew in Colorado, uh, who has been a software engineer uh, for over 20 years, weighed in on the conversation Justin and I had yesterday about return to the office. And Andrew says, it's only going to be half-baked for now because of those exceptions. Andrew says, in years gone by, there's always the odd one or two people in the company who are so valuable or a particular system, so they got special treatment. Starting with the pandemic, every team I've been on has had at least one person in a different city, if not time zone, from the rest of the group. Andrew says, I've been lucky to be that person a couple of times. That means all interactions and meetings have to be digital first. And my in-office experience is worse because I have to commute. Now I'm in an open plan where everybody else is also on their multi-time zone meetings. Andrew says top leaders also exploit this by being present via video in meetings that have an in-person expectation. Uh, The times when I sat within 20 feet of my whole team, incredibly collaborative, says Andrew, but there were no compromises. If we couldn't hire someone for our role locally, we just lacked that role. Companies need to invest in a no compromise. And I just don't see that happening, at least not yet. Thank you, uh, Andrew, for sharing your thoughts on this uh, as well. Yeah, it is it is somewhat frustrating if they make you go to the office and then you still have to do a video conference because the boss didn't come into the office. So I hear yeah. what you're saying. Uh, before we get out of here, let's check in with Len Peralta, who has been drawing something based on the tech news for us, as he does. Thank you, Len. What have you drawn for us today? You know, it's funny you should mention that. Uh, I say every show I'm drawing the top tech stories. And uh, I think the biggest tech story this week, obviously, was the uh, data leak of uh, 2.9 billion uh, uh, secu- uh, Social Security numbers uh, leaked. Now, Steve seems to be pretty calm about the whole thing. But as the artist here, I have to kind of exaggerate. And uh, this is the image that I created of all these people. Two- <laughs> 2.9 billion people is a lot of people. It's and, not people. Uh, it's records. Records. Yeah, yes. that's that's like half the population of Earth, and they don't all have Social Security <laughs> numbers. <laughs> It'd be something interesting. But yeah. Um, uh, so yeah. So this is my the image I drew. It's just called Social Security numbers. You know, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and if you're interested in getting this, uh, obviously you can just go to my Patreon, patreoncom slash len Back me at the DTNS lover level, or go the old fashioned route and uh, go to my online store and uh, maybe even commission me you never know mm. i could uh, do yeah. something really nice for you nice i've nice done it i recommend it commission len Thank and you so uh much. 
I mean, you made that social security number card look delicious. <laughs> it was, it was, yes, it was very delicious. <laughs> I ate them all too. <laughs> Uh, Steve Zalewski, so nice to have you on the show. Thank you for joining us and let people know where they can find you elsewhere. Oh, sure. So S3 Consulting, you can go ahead and reach out um, to my website or on LinkedIn and be happy to be able to support the community any way I can. Thank you so much, Steve. And thanks again to uh, David Spark uh, for uh, loaning you, <laughs> recommending you, sending you over the, this way. We appreciate that uh, over at the CISO series as well. Patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. It's Friday, uh, like, and on Fridays we like to do something fun. So we're doing a tech quiz this week. In honor of Steve's five years working at Levi Strauss, Roger put together a quiz about the intersection of fashion and technology, including denim. So try to answer the questions before we do. Play along and find out, patrons and stick around for that. It is our fourth annual DTNS Experiment Week, which starts next week. We're swapping out our normal DTNS show, trying out some brand new ideas, and we have great episodes coming up from Scott Johnson, Blair Bazdrich, Will Smith, and on Monday, we're going to go deep, a deep dive into the data science that goes into election polling with Andrea Jones-Roy. Prepare yourselves. It'll be knowledgeable, and it'll be fun. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and co-host Rob Dunwood. Video producer Joe Kuntz. Producer at large Anthony Lamos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer Dan Campos. Science correspondent Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCal, Captain Kipper, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A, Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Tom McNeil. Our contributors this week included Justin Robert Young, Jason Howell, Chris Christensen, and Scott Johnson. And our guests this week were Sean Hollister and Steve Zalewski. And thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>